What's the secret to catching a big West Virginia smallmouth? Lures. All different sizes. The Shenandoah River, where is it? Well, it flows through Northern Virginia and meets the Potomac River at Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, which is right on the tip of that one funky arm of West Virginia that juts all the way out east. Now, if you're a Civil War history buff, Harpers Ferry's got your name on it. History happened here, folks. It's also got your name on it if you're a smallmouth freak such as myself. Now back in May, I put out a call on Facebook asking fans where we should go shoot our next episode. And longtime fan and guide Travis Edens chimed in right away and said, yo dude, I've been trying to get you to come down to the Shenandoah for a long time. So being 65 miles from the nation's capital, this fishery is very underlooked. Compared to the Susquehanna and the New River, uh, we're talking a much smaller fishery. It's kind of a it's kind of a diamond in the rough. Now, knowing that Travis is primarily a fly guy at heart, and that I wanted to primarily throw flies, I brought along my buddy James Bonanno Jr. James works in one of the tackle shops close to home, and he is a hardcore young gun fly stick. He ties killer bugs. He knows smallmouth. They even call him Jimmy the Bass. Let's loosen you up a little bit. Um, Can I go pee? I've always been involved with fly fishing somehow or some way, whether it be tying my own flies or picking it up for a couple months here and there. But this year I really dedicated myself to picking up the long rod and um, really giving it some hell. Now of course with hook shots there is always some little curveball twist caveat to whatever the hell I'm trying to do at any given time. So we've got like a half day here to just get warmed up on the Shenandoah, which is running pretty heavily stained. We'll start out with uh, Loudon on top. You see all the gray hairs? I've got extra gray hairs now from this trip. So the gauges and stuff, you, know, you look at those over and over again, and they look just fine, nice and steady, and then all of a sudden, overnight, boom, things shot up. A dirty river doesn't really turn me off if I have the right gear. Yes, we mainly plan to throw flies, but James and I both brought a limited selection of spinning gear as backup. What we did not bring were heavy bait casters, spinner baits, jigs, and all the good stuff that might actually turn your luck around in chocolate milk. And we tried with top water, and top water just was not effective. So we finally had to switch to soft plastics, and voila. Icebreaker, icebreaker, out of the dirt. You know, and you're trying to stay amped up, but really you just feel like you're pissing in the wind. However, every once in a while, you can make some pretty good lemonade out of pee. As we're drifting down the river, kind of hit a patch of dead water, and we look over on the bank. Start noticing carp hitting top. What are they biting? little green berries. It is not mulberries, but luckily, I always have the Vermont Purple Foam Beer Koozie on hands for situations such as this. I don't think it took more than 10 presentations to finally slap one right in front of this fish that was up. There we go. <laughs> and uh, this fish dumped him into the backing within seconds. Oh shit, we're in backing. And it took us for a little bit of a ride. He's not giving up so easily. Nope. Eventually, through a lot of effort, we were able to get that sucker in. There we go. <laughs> that is what you call dirty water lemonade right there. When the smallmouth bite is not doing it yet, and you see these fish sipping berries under the tree, I will take it all day. You couldn't have asked for a better moment. You know, every angler knows that even under terrible conditions, sometimes just that low light at magic hour at the end of the day gets something going. We, uh, we had high hopes of a, of a topwater bite, but nothing really formulated. There was a little bit of a hatch going on on the river, nothing really feeding heavily. We did not turn another carp or another smallmouth for the rest of the night, which left Travis wondering, what the heck are we gonna do tomorrow? Fried pickle, 7 a.m.? <laughs> sure. Now luckily, Travis had a buddy that had been doing pretty well with smallmouths on the North Fork of the Shenandoah, about 40 miles away from Harper's Ferry. He was able to tell us that the clarity was much better. I don't really consider the North Fork my home water, 
but you got to go to where the water's better and where the fish are biting. I took one look at the North Fork and fell in love. This looks like such juicy fly water. The North Fork of the Shenandoah is, is basically a, a glorified oversized trout stream. So right off the top, starting to move the, the smaller dinks. After about two dozen fish, you're like, man, where are these big fish laid up? Like, what are we doing wrong? And then we start noticing some bigger fish being moved. Oh, like that one. That was a real one. I mean, James and I are switching flies every 10 minutes, trying to get dialed in. I had it in my head that I wanted to stick the first, first decent fish on the fly, but I also didn't want to shoot myself in the foot. And he switched up to a small X wrap. That's a nice fish. Finally, James pulled the first substantial fish. And we actually didn't get a whole lot further before I finally had a decent fish come out and really commit to that streamer. The caliber just seems to be ticking up a hair at a time. And then we hit the dam. So at the start of this stretch of river that we were going to run, uh, I had some hesitation about it because there is a small dam on it. When you have this big raft, you know. Luckily, there was enough water for Travis to just shoot it and on we went. But here's the significant thing about the dam. But that dam definitely marked the line from small fish to larger fish. Oh yeah, dude. That's the one I've been waiting for. Yeah. Yes! Waiting all day for that one. The rest of the float, we continued to catch, catch fish on everything. The jerk bait again was a hot ticket. Uh, different flies, different poppers. And late in the day, with not much float left, James finally stuck himself a quality fish on the long rod. Nice fish, dude! Yeah, man. Knew there had to be one good one in that pile. You know, so even though the North Fork made us work pretty hard for its bigger fish, we ended up having a really fun day. And the high note that ended that day was that young James got his first ever taste of guacamole. Mmm. Not making that up, kid never had guacamole. What's up everybody? You ever have one of them days where the smallmouth are hitting the popper just drifting better than popping? It happens to me most often when a lot of bugs are hatching. That's because when the popper is dead drifting, the dress tail hook is dangling just a few inches below the surface. And smallmouths often mistake that dangling tail hook for an emerging insect. A lot of poppers come with white tails, but who says you can't match the hatch? What I do is throw some treble hooks in the fly tying vise and make my own tails out of bucktail with natural colors like black, olive, and brown. Then, when you're on the river, pay close attention to the color of the bugs that are hatching. By carrying poppers with different color tails, you can be almost as effective as a fly guy with a box full of dries. And it's tricks like these kids that might help you fool that unicorn bronze. So you know, Travis thinks the lower Shenandoah is gonna be back in play that last day. So the next morning, get up nice, bright and early, head down to my home sections there. Is it cleaner than it was two days ago? Absolutely. Is it clean enough to be effective with fly gear and minimal spinning tackle? Iffy, very iffy. We're gonna skip the mud and go back to the juice. Skip the mud, go back to the juice, the clear water, we know they're there. We were on the fence about hitting North Fork again, but at least having to do that float on the North Fork for the first day, it gave us a lot of ideas in our head on what we were gonna do if we had to hit it again. Now we figured, look, at worst, we're gonna catch a whole mess of small, small mouths again. And then as we're floating the same stretch of river that we stuck eight to 12 inches on the previous day, all of a sudden it just opened up. And within a half hour, we got a pattern going. The day before, those fish could have cared less about being in the shade. Today, you get anything up in the shade line and it's getting eight. <laughs> oh, he's off. We're seeing some big fish. We're seeing them in places that they, we didn't see them the day before. We're sitting on beds. So what we learned yesterday was not to be married to any one thing. Have a Senko ready, have a tube ready. If you're not moving them on the fly, that fish was laid up on a bed, Senko, bango. Travis! After passing through the first bridge, I made a cast up into an eddy with the fluke and I, I moved a decent shadow. I, I kept with it and that's what I ended up sticking my biggest fish of the day on. Nice fish. James sticks this 18 inch fish. Yeah! <laughs> Boys and girls, 
That's what we came here for. You know, it was a complete reversal from the first float on the North Fork. As the sun got lower on the second day, the bite actually started to dry up. But honestly, we didn't care. We felt like we conquered this river together as a team. And when you consider that we had to go to plan D here, we had a hell of a three days fishing with Travis. In the words of Travis Eames, all the worrying is over. All in all, I think it was a great trip. These guys fished hard. We have not gotten a bite in like an hour. James, to his credit, still casting. Oh, I'm, I'm loose as a goose. Good. Oh, you pulled it away from him. Gotta let him suck it. <laughs> suck it, suck it, suck it. Yes, sir.